we did this to help people understand better the military industrial complex. We use the uh, letters MIC for that. And um, you know how it works, exposing it, the impacts, like I said, in the South. And we have tried to like pick out examples through and, and, and splatter them through here about how people are working against it or resisting or using, you know. Well, everyone's familiar with Ike's prophetic warning, so we can probably. Yeah, so through. you know, be, be aware, you know, of the um, you know acquisition of unwanted influence of the military industrial complex, and that's what he said. But sometimes we think he might have meant this. <laughs> <laughs> we try to throw in a little levity. Yeah, and um, the military-industrial complex is the joining of like business and government and military, the corporate government, and military all joined together. This is a big puppet down at the uh, School of the Americas in 2010. You can you can see the uh, our friend Ken down at the bottom of it. Actually, the MIC is like shoving people into its mouth and eating them. Um, and, and, of course, the global economic war machine has many parts. You can just read a few of them down there. There are more and more. It's growing in its influence, Tom. And that image that we captured seems to say it all. So when we talk about the environmental impacts, you can see it's more than just the water and the earth and the wind. It's everything that makes up our culture and society, economy, politics, and all the industry. It's just, it's just pervasive. So the MIC determines pushes and profits from U.S. war policy, and you know funding a weapon system is difficult. But try taking one away. We, of course, are supporting and exporting capitalism and privatizing the profits, socializing the losses. That's a familiar phrase because it is business, and we are investing our children. So how is that war economy working for you, folks? So it has infected our scientific research. is like symbolic of the project. Anyone here? How many people know the project Paperclip? It was like after World War II. It was like the, between us and the Russians rushing to like, um, you know, coerce, uh, blackmail, um, you know, kidnap, uh, you know, ardent Nazi uh, scientists, engineers, doctors, and bring them to the United States and, you know, uh, give them. Uh, citizenship and expunge their records and give them positions in all kinds of dummy dummy groups and dumb, dummy corporations uh, fronted by the CIA to like get their technology and at somewhere in, somewhere in that uh, the sort of their mindset becomes embedded within the military industrial uh, complex. Of course, uh, undermining academic freedom. Many, many, many universities depend upon uh, money from the Pentagon. Um, Oak Ridge Institute for Nuclear Studies that was partnering with Southeast Universities, but today more than 100 Southern institutions are, are, are coordinating with the Pentagon. So we refer to science and technology in service for the warfare state. It's polluting the physical, cultural, political environments. Uh, represented like uh, you know wrongful imprisonment in, in, in Guantanamo for years on pars. The you know let's spread five and ten thousand dollars around if you know if you know what the Taliban are uh, if you know a terrorist. Yes, you know that sheep herder out there. He's one. Here's your money. He's gone. Coleman likes the bubbles there. So well, I mean they are cool. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> and, and of course oh, you need to see that one again. <laughs> yeah, we all know it's devastating the planet. We don't have to look far. We go 25 miles down where Shauna was just working on. An issue. Uh, we we've been to mountaintop removal sites. We know about the sonar damage to our, our marine wildlife. Um, I believe it's still true. Uh, President Bush exempted the Navy from the uh, Marine Animal Protection Act. The Pentagon and its nefarious environmental uh, damage is often flying under the radar of agencies that might uh, we might think protect us. This this well actually now I'm remembering it. Um, wash ashore in North Florida um, after the military was uh, testing sonar. So it's also wasting the heavens. There's like half, you know, uncountable. Let's say half a million pieces of uh, of used satellites, balls, rocket parts. They're all tracked in Earth orbit. Space junk. It's like you know, traveling you know, tremendous speed. And NASA has no plan for mitigating the hazards of junk flying around the planet. Uh, they even did a movie on it. If you remember that. So. Um, if we want to expand empire, which we're doing uh, daily, uh, it requires the energy, and we all know what's going on. We just look at the folks at Standing Rock, but they're up against in other places. Um, if you, you, again, the Hope at 20 Mine Site occupation. Uh, uh, as you, the lower picture, you can see the young people standing in front of that huge machine. 
we, we extract energy and with no concern for its impact on the planet and the people. You're probably most familiar with like uh, the derricks and the pulling of oil out of you know places all over the south. Uh, fracking is coming in. Uh, there is no safe fracking, and the largest unmined deposit of uranium is in South Central Virginia. And if they mine that, that goes into the Roanoke River, and that flows into North Carolina, and that that's drinking water for about a million people from Richmond on down. So our vulnerability is vast as well. So the MIC is the single largest consumer of petroleum worldwide. And you know, the US military uses enough oil in one year to run the entire our entire transit system for estimates between you know 14, 15 to 20 years, 14 to 22 years. And and you know, the, the, the Department of Defense, you know, has no requirements to uh, to, to report its domestic and overseas use through its contractors. So there's lots of hidden hidden use. It's uh, you know, of course we 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 could just go online and search around for this, but the people who put the information up there have, it's really difficult to dig this information out. So we're fortunate to have, you know, access to the technology and it's just so easy to show you this. But in fact it's so many hidden uses of oil primarily uh, throughout the entire uh, military regime on this globe. So waging global war speeds global warming, and and, and this this I find interesting. They're greener. The, the U.S. military is very aware of climate change and its effect on their war fighter readiness is the term they use. Um, so it's not to be green. Um, it's it's to take care of their plans. You know, to be a dominant fighting force forever. They we we aim. This, this is like right. I don't know this gentleman, Ray Mavis, Secretary of the Navy, you know, 2012, but it takes care, what they're doing with the divert, diversifying, as you said, it's like, you know, it takes care of a military vulnerability. Um, and the military is quite aware of global warming. They're raising the wharfs, you know, four or six feet, all the way up and down the coast on both sides. And they're buying up land as buffer zone land and, uh, so that they can... Uh, War is peace. So the MIC acts with impunity. Uh, as this example of the use of depleted uranium, uh, which we heard a little bit last night, it was Kathy, right behind. Mm -hmm. But as you heard from her report from Berlin, um, and some of us call it weaponized uranium because depleted is a misnomer. When that stuff, uh, uh, it becomes an aerosol on the field. It is a weapon that lasts forever. And the term depleted comes from the fact that it's just uh, not. It's 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 lost enough of its efficient energy. Uh, to be used, it can't be used in a uh, reactor anymore, but it can be, and it's heavier than lead, it's used as an armor-piercing projectile, and it doesn't explode, uh, it pierces two inches, three inches of steel plate on a tank, and that release, that kinetic energy, like, you know, ignites it, and like immediately goes up to like three, four thousand degrees inside that tank, and that's what you see them happening when you watch them shoot one of these things at a, at a big, at a big thing. And the violation, of course, of mass and indiscriminate destruction that goes on through generations is the war crime. Which is a violation of the Geneva Convention mm -hmm. of the Use of Intergenerational Weapons. We're, we're speeding along here. Um, so, I'll let you well, we, we go back and forth on this one, but you know, it also promotes a type of American war Christianity that glorifies violence and armed forces and kind of makes pronouncements about the wrath on the designated enemies. It's, it's, it, it pollutes our spiritual religious values. It calls to question whether or not the United States actually you know, is engaged in some form of a holy war. Well, we've got it on our side. Yes. And of course, many of you have seen this image of the young woman from Occupy after hit, hit by a rubber bullet. It's going around now on the, on the DAPL sites. Uh, she was not. She may have been there also, but this was, we've had this picture a long time. But, and of course, she, yeah, yeah, but that, that's indicative of the damage that can be done when, you, when you're um, hit by rubber bullets. And so there's a, the, the Center for Constitutional Rights is a, is a particularly good, you know, legal, um, uh, you know, like center understanding these rights. And that's their quote that since 9-11, our democracy has just become so undone that it may never be regained. Um, the, the, the civil liberties of prisoners, they're force feeding this, you know, this fellow at, at uh, Guantanamo. And one of the horrible statistics of the military is that one in three women in the military and men too 
uh, but one a third of the women in the military have been sexually assaulted. You know, at least 500,000 military men and women are assaulted since 1991, and so. It's a fairly sad situation. All that is happening while we continue to militarize the homeland, and we're seeing a lot of that played out in the images that we're seeing. Particularly, you know, we're all, we all know what's going on out in North Dakota. These folks look particularly benign now compared to the kind of images that are coming out of South Dakota, North Dakota. Uh, the police here, uh, at least their visors are up, and you can see their faces. So the National Defense Authorization Act effectively endorses war without end, makes indefinite military detention without charge or trial a permanent feature of the American legal system. And, and the drones, some of this uh, statistically, we probably can update, um, but yes, um, you've got the drone pilot down there, that Coleman likes his bubbles just like at the RK, uh, but seriously, if you talk to some of the drone pilots and the, the post-traumatic stress, the stress they're under, um, you know, killing by remote control and going home to their family the same night, it's a difficult I mean, these drone pilots, you get up and leave, um, strap in just like they're in a, in a cockpit, and they have uh, within the military the highest rate of PTS. That, well, it used to be a point, you might be more familiar with hearing PTSD, but since, you know, in the past years I've realized that it's not a disorder. It's a quite a normal response to the type of stresses that they're under. And so, you know, we might stumble over it, but we're trying to move. Like, it's, it's a post-traumatic you know, post -traumatic stress, and it's not really a disorder. Uh, that's a one-inch rope. They've got a listening device attached to the back of it, and, you know, all the way from weaponized to non-weaponized drones, and they're using, like, drones over North Dakota for surveillance of possible dispersion of, like, different type of uh, uh, incapacitating agents and tear gas and things like that. This is happening, and all we've talked about is going on is the U.S. Space Command breaks treaty after treaty. There is, like, you know, international treaties banning the weaponization um, of space, yet, you know, that's where the race is. And, and, and our friend Bruce Gagnon with the Global Network of, of, against nuclear weapons, you know, he's, he's on it, so follow that work. Doesn't he have a relationship with these people? He, he does. So let's move along. <laughs> <laughs> he does. So um, again, I, you know, uh, he must have been thinking some of it. But the problem in defense is how far you can go without destroying from within what you're trying to defend from without. And the, the military has a plan called full spectrum dominance. Oh, yeah. You know, which is like complete control of the land, of the air, the water, the space, every potential theater of war. We've got to control it, so we've got to dominate that. And we sometimes talk back and forth. It takes a full spectrum resistance to, to you know, to work on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, militarism is defiling the earth and the air. We know Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the, and the horrific damage of that that it ushered us into this nuclear age and depleting the ozone layer with all those tests, uh, further harming it. Our rivers and springs, uh, this is just White Oak Creek outside of Oak Ridge Y-12 nuclear weapons complex, um, and, and so loaded. many of our, our uh, Tennessee rivers and waterways. And it's just loaded with different type of isotopes that come out of that space, and uh, there are a number of incredible, I mean, like horribly irradiated, um, you know, uh, places across the south and up until Fukushima went down, uh, many of the places in, in and around that you'll see some later were the most radioactive places. Our so, seas and our oceans, um, and, and much of this information probably is, is even more horrific than we've been able to discover, the widespread and hazardous effect of these sunken military, auxiliary, and merchant marine so, vessels. So this is 9,000 dots. Um, you know, like represent sunken, um, you know, marine vessels from World War II. And like the, uh, like the debris in space uh, to what we've been able to discover, the Navy or whoever should be in charge of that has no plan for dealing with these, these barrels of, of, of toxins that are leaking and rusting down below. So those time bombs are down there too. So it's the fuel cleansing chemicals, anything that they've used, you know, in, in pursuing their trade. And there are 11 submarines, eight reactors, we think, down there with no plan to recover them. That's from other nations as well. Um, that's a good question. I was understanding when we pulled this information, that's, that, that's just ours. Just ours. But again, you know, it's in the ocean, it's hidden, but this is what they've revealed. Um, so it's, it's destroying... Yeah. Pardon? Go ahead. 
as well. All the time. You know. So all of this, I mean, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistics, and this is happening. The impact on the children is horrific, and you know the, the cliche almost that like every every drone strike, every attack, you know, um, you know, in Iraq is like creating, you know, another another warrior against us. And when we hear these horrific statistics, we tend to become inured because it's just so hard to hear it, and, and you can identify maybe with one death, but when you just hear high numbers of civilians killed, it, it, it changes something. So this, 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 this activity leaves a toxic legacy, you know, for endless generations, and it's not an attempt to grow you out, but the effect of uh, lack of iron in during, you know, prenatal can affect, you know, uh, uh, the growth of the child, but this is a, a baby out of Fallujah. Uh, with, you know, again, the radiation in Hiroshima, landmines are a horrible effect, leave, leave a terrible scar. Um, you know, the, the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam has affected both, you know, our, our soldiers and their children as well as the children and the people of Vietnam. Again, I mean, the real war on terror, you know, has got to be the post-traumatic stress and the, um, Actually, after our mission accomplished in Iraq, the health, there's, there's so much irradiated dust across Iraq that the uh, Iraqi health, pardon? Yeah, the, 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 health, uh, the health minister in Iraq advised women of childbearing age just like, don't do it. Well, we have to ask, is this willful ignorance that we don't know, or the psychic numbness? Of course, we're all affected by that. Uh, but that military-industrial complex, it's that sacred pole in the room. So jumping right into where we live, um, Roosevelt occupied the Jim Crow South with military bases. He had to win southern votes to pass the New Deal. Um, and he got the votes, and we got the jobs. Want to guess what the jobs were? You'll find out. Yeah. So the military maintains there must be national sacrifice zones where weapons and soldiers can be tested for war. And there are over 8,000 what is called formerly used defense sites nationwide. So FUDs you know, include the former military bases, ammunition depots, ordnance plants, bombing. There are over 1,000 in the south alone. And the, you know, they, they are like finding them in developments. This is a picture from Camp Butner, which is north which was north of what is now Durham, and you know, large housing developments as they clean up and like, you know, do the groundwork or find the unexploded ordinance. And they, so you recognize, retreat, and report it. We'll come get it, and hopefully you don't get, you know. Hurt. So when you see the star that says FUD site on other slides, that means that place we're describing is also a formerly used so this, site. You know, we have a... a we have we have, we have a, an expert in the room on the super funds, right? Right. So you check us on this because you know some of this is dated for sure. But it, 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 you know, just within the past couple of years, there were over 1,300 super fund sites. Over 900 of them were FUDs, including 141 military bases. Uh, the military and the VA are not required to notify personnel about exposure to like what's called contaminants of concern. Mm -hmm. And uh, one in ten Americans live within 10 miles of a super fund site. And uh, so it is. The, the, there are human sacrifice zones. I call them fence line communities. We talked about environmental racism. Um, it's really everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere you go, particularly in these so-called fence line communities. So the low-income residents and people of color bear the brunt of living in these fence lines communities. And African Americans are roughly 80% more likely um, to live in these communities. And more than half of the people in a two-mile radius of polluting facilities are people of color. So we asked ourselves and asking the general question then is the South a sacrifice zone? Plus just you can read it all, we've got everything. And it's it's created a situation uh, that, that we can claim being the most militarized region in the US. And it's not like a, something to be necessarily proud of, but it's certain certainly you know something we want to be aware of. Um, I, I, I have a sense that we need to know about our home places and within certain radiuses of where we live, I think we have a, a responsibility to find out what's around us and where these places are and what's going on around us. And when you pass a factory, don't assume it's doing what it says it's doing. Investigate. So uh, Martin connects it all fine. He kind of got in trouble for doing this when he says question the whole society. That's where he like connected the dots between racism, economic exploitation, and war, and tied them all together. 
um, Memphis, uh, this is uh, a woman and her family that were uh, living in South Memphis neighborhood. Um, and since World War II, they were just polluting that area with all those horrific uh, pollutants. Um, and her quote, Doris Bradshaw, I think is very telling about, uh, that's also a FUD site and a Superfund site, uh, the way they've treated people of color throughout the U.S. is the way they're treating countries of color throughout the world. She had quite the insight in that. Another place that's highly polluted by the petrochemical polyvinyl, different factories, coal-fired power plants, the pollutants from large oil refineries, and there, certainly the, the American population benefits from, you know, much of this too. But we run off a war economy, and so much of what the infrastructure is used uh, ends up going into the war effort. But uh, Mossville, Louisiana, was founded by freed slaves in the Civil War, and it it ranks way up in the toxic, you know, apocalypse hall of apocalypse hall of fame sites. Um, Say that again. Toxic apocalypse hall of fame site. <laughs> Say that five times. But Mossville Environmental Action Now mean it's it's you know it's it's the group there, the, the local citizens that are resisting and fighting this, and there was a. German or a Dutch company that was like offering to buy the entire town. Yeah, so that it could be a sacrifice zone in entirety. Rather than care for the people and clean it up, he was going to buy their entire historic area. They fought that. Gulf Fork, Mississippi uh, was not was a, a, a staging area for sending barrels of Agent Orange into um, the war in Vietnam, but also received you know leftover barrels which sat around for years uh, you know, you know, leaking, um, and we're familiar with the legacy of, 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 most people would be familiar with the legacy of Agent Orange and the impacts that it's had. Monsanto and Dow destroyed, the forest killed, main crippled millions of people. There's been no accountability and, you know, no compensation to the people. Uh, our Vietnam Veterans for Peace have a project dealing with Agent Orange now, so that's something worth looking into. Um, right. Two so, of my brothers were poisoned by that. They were Marines in Vietnam, and they were dead before they were out of their 40s from the residual effects of those poisons. Twins. So what they ended up doing was um, carrying the barrels out into the Gulf and incinerating them, and that's what's going on there in that top right corner. On the Vulcan. Now back to Huntsville and the Redstone Arsenal and the Nazis we introduced you to earlier, and especially with Operation Paperclip, this officer Werner von Braun um, was, most you know, no was most notable. He was a smart guy and he had a lot of, of, of scientific information, so we were quite willing to pardon that he was he was uh, perfecting his rocket science in death camps. Uh, and so I mean they they built the rockets, they they you know they buried chemical weapons right down there in Huntsville, you know, they, they converted eventually the ga mustard gas plants to pesticide. Um, and again, um, like this is the Redstone Arsenal, but it's also the U.S. Army Missile Command and the Marshall Space Flight Center, and it's incredibly important, you know, uh, and it's vital to plan to weaponize and nuclearize, you know, space. And we quote again Bruce Gagnon, he understands the South is vital to the plan. For weaponizing space. So by this time, you know, the the use of propellant, something called perchlorate, uh, which is a solid or liquid, is like found in the drinking water, the ground water, the surface water of over 43 states. So we've been poisoned by rocket science. And so this is just a map representing the U.S. chemical weapons storage stockpile. I mean, much, I mean, we, we have so much of what we, you know, have banned in other countries or tried to keep other countries from having. Syria, most notable. Aniston. I have a friend who, who was raised in Aniston, Alabama. You might know Aniston during civil rights. That's where the bus was um, burned. burned. Uh, we have someone in the room who's from Aniston, Alabama. So you could tell us perhaps a little bit about the, the, the situation there and the gas masks that were issued to the residents. When, when they decided to incinerate uh, massive amounts of you know the chemicals that were stored there. The plan for downwind was distribution of 35,000 gas masks to the citizens of Birmingham, and that actually is a family, and you can see it, but you can't see in the care is just you. Uh, you can see the, the 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 pipe off the left, and like the cover over the baby carriage that you know that took care of everybody. I spent a couple months there for the U.S. EPA mm -hmm. researching that site. So that's pretty accurate what we're we're reporting. It's it's horrific. Mm -hmm. 
And again, that's a that's a community that is is, is not all that wealthy. And, and and wouldn't you say, David, Aniston? Not all that wealthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pine Bluff, Arkansas, is America's chemical arsenal, one of the largest you know like collections over seven hundred. That's a largely African American community. It's not far from Memphis. Um, there was uh, a big fire there where white phosphorus, which pretty much if it catches it, you can't put it out. You know, it went off, and over seven thousand canisters of this stuff burned, and you know they just can't re they can't reclaim that. Eastern Kentucky, the Bluegrass Bluegrass Army Depot didn't have as much you know in storage as these other places you saw, but like the Kentucky Environmental Foundation like organized and sustained a community resistance and like you know like halted the the incineration um, and dispersion of like those chemicals across Kentucky. But they're still there behind the uh, barbed wire fence since the 40s. Uh, this is close to where we live, so I don't know. It's just, uh, just you know, stones throw. If you know where Warren Wilson College is near Asheville, this is just the other side. This for 50 years, they it, it produced um, incapacitating agents, explosives, other chemical toxins. It's still, still super fun in a flood site. And um, uh, it's owned by Halliburton now. And it leaches in the nearby creek, it dumps in the Swannanoa River, which feeds into the French Broad River. And if you live there, you know, the locals know where not to fish. Because, you know, it might be particularly dilute, but it's still available. And when you're measuring things in like parts per, you know, billions or quadrillions, a little bit. This well, is yeah. Slide. Um, this one particularly hit me having Marine Brothers that, that, that are y'all leaving? Bye. Love Thanks you. For Thank you by. for coming. See ya. Keep it up. There's a slogan in the Marine Corps, we take care of the, our own, it's a lie. This is how they take care of them, exposing over a million people to up to 70 identified toxins in the contaminated water that the Marine Corps knew about. Well, it, it was in family housing units. It was a cover-up, and there's now the highest incident of breast cancer among Marines. Male, the highest, highest rate of male breast cancer in the country is within this, this, this target group. And um, even they, they, these pollutants came from you know, underground storage tanks on the site, the chemicals that they use for cleaning and maintaining the weapons and the machinery, but also you know, um, they send the uniforms to the dry cleaners off site and it leaked back onto the site. So it came from everywhere. And like she said, for 30 years they held this and it was a Marine's Marine, a, you know, a sergeant major drill instructor who finally came forth after his daughter, daughter, his daughter was killed, was by, killed by the cancer. And that once, once, you know, they could not deny his credibility. So that's, that's when it was released and they began, oops, we need to deal with this. Did they ever clean it up? Um, um, there have been projects to like, you know, re remediate, clean up is sort of a relative term. But, I mean, once, once, once it's done. Yeah, yeah, our EPA person here can tell us about you know, that. If it was cleaned up, she would be able to tell you how they attempted to do it. But, you know, for the most part, the residuals are there, and they part of the cleanup is to make you aware. Um, she just served drugs and alcohol with this slideshow. <laughs> About 30 minutes before we start. <laughs> Let me tell you about this one right here. You're like, you know. But someone who was about to say something. Sorry. Are y'all are y'all seriously that we we were we done y'all? No, no. Okay. Should okay. we go on? But well, but if that was a death sentence to the Marines, I mean, I think if this is like a, a federal uh, medical center for women. It's the only one, and so when I was in prison in Alderson, West Virginia, women were afraid to admit they had a sprained ankle or they had a deep illness. They feared going to Carswell. Carswell was the prison where you likely would die. There was all the, the, the priest there, the chaplain there was abusing women. The, I mean, it was just, it was just a horrific place. Um, but it's also a formerly used defense site and a super fun site set right up on top. So we imprison people and then we poison them simultaneously. Um, and that's in Fort Worth, Texas. And just that militarism, um, how is that connected? Well, it's just totally connected with our indifference to our populace.
them, but broken arrows is, is military jargon for like nuclear weapons accident. And, you know, they dropped atom bombs and hydrogen bombs all over the South. This was in South Carolina. It accidentally went out the plane. It didn't have nuclear package in it, but it pretty much damaged the farmers in the area. Um, off of Tybee Island in Georgia, there was a mid-air accident, and the protocol is to parachute out the package. So a, a, a huge hydrogen bomb parachuted right off of Tybee Island in the water, and reportedly never, never recovered it. Um, and 61, Goldsboro, North Carolina, uh, there was another mid-air refueling accident, and B-52 went down. The pilot was killed, but they parachuted out too. They found one in the swamp. They dug it up, and the triggers, all, except for one, had been tripped on impact, so they just left the other one sitting over there in the swamp. They're going to kill us before this is over, but in, <laughs> South, <laughs> in South Mississippi, I mean, I didn't know this. This was just close to where I was raised. You know, they've got a little monument. Essentially, don't dig here because that's where they buried it. All they, they detonated this. They did underground small, nuclear tests, you know, like they in said. In salt mine areas. Well, you know, they, they said they were, like, uh, studying, like, seismic propagation, and uh, 5.3 kilotons is about half of what we dropped on Hiroshima. But, I mean, look at this. They pay people, of course, you know, hey, for your inconvenience of this bomb that we're dropping, you get $5 per child. Well, they didn't really drop a bomb. It was, like, loaded into the ground and exploded, but it was the same pretty much effect. 400 residents There's were evacuated. Did you know how far underground was yeah. they put it? Did you all know about this one? No, I didn't either. In a salt dome, underneath. Oh, wasn't that good? Isn't that good to learn? Okay, keep going, Tom. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, another very uh, close, not too far from here, Kings Bay. And John Martini can give you all the information you need on the Trident. You know, when the questions come up, but the Trident submarine is, is, a, is, a, is a Cold War offensive first strike weapon when it's fully loaded with 24 missiles and each missile has eight independently targetable, you know, you know, like hydrogen bombs on it, that's a powerful weapon. I think we're kind of beating them hard. Let's keep it. Okay, where well, are we going to do that? You know, it's... <laughs> the funny thing is, is remember Peg McIntyre and a bunch of all old, right? We're all retired old gray hairs. People would drive by and yell, get a job! <laughs> <laughs> I mean... And, and like people, of, and people of all ilk, the soldier, soldiers, sailors, they've all been betrayed and sacrificed through the experiments. Are horrific stuff. Uh, if I picked one on here in the bottom left, Project Shad, they put the Marines and the sailors in the boat, took them out in the water, and they released agents into the air conditioning system and just studied to see what would happen. Um, Closer, just over the mountains from Asheville, if you go to 26 into Tennessee, the first little town to come to is Urban Nuclear Fuel Services there. It has the DOE contract to down mix and separate and recycle primarily military radioactive waste. And it's just a, the, the culture is a callous disregard of health and safety. And uh, people do get hurt up there. They produce the nuclear fuel for the Trident subs. And then just down the road from it, in a little beautiful small you know turn of 19, early 1900s town of Jonesboro is a depleted uranium weapons facility um, and if you go up there then people kind of are aware it's, they don't really think about it there's a war crime happening there in and the storytelling capital of America and you know um, and it's, I, 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 no you can't do that can't quite get on the stage for that one but uh, a military plan came up with the uh, great method for getting rid of this. We just give this stuff away free to other countries who sign a contract for its specific use. How big is this world? Uh, well, uh, I bet David can tell me the relative side, but like the ones in the front bottom, I don't know the caliber, but that big. And the ones in the back, you know, the armor piercing, you know. Mm -hmm. And the cancers always have increased many fold. Well, wherever we've used these weapons, and the early weapons were used in the late 60s in Kosovo by the Navy. So uh, we get the impact in North Carolina uh, downstream and downwind. Um, you know, coming like like I was saying from uh, nuclear fuel services, it gets in the water. That's another chucking. They found you know found uh, the signatures 95 miles downstream. And this <coughs> sinkhole here opened up in a schoolyard. Half a mile, half a mile from the plant. Half a mile from the plant. So they drop the dye in the sinkhole to see what's going on, and it comes up in the. Um, in the Nolichucky, or the creek that feeds the Nolichucky. And then um, the 
pollutants for the most part are heavy metals and gravity will affect on them so there's a wind type effect over the ridges but they, a large cluster of cancer you know uh, are located um, you know in Madison County which is the county next to where we live um, and this highest cancer rate in North Carolina we pretty much sure I mean pretty much uh, 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 you know, like like due to this, and it's twice that of the national average. And there is there is a, a woman living nearby in Jonesboro, Tennessee, who was contacted by Christian peacemaker teams, uh, made aware of what she was living down the road from, and she actually brought the whole United for Peace and Justice event to Little Jonesboro and shook that town. Up. So this is just, I mean, like to show you, I mean, the, the ammunition plants everywhere, and you get all kinds of like airborne as well as like waterborne pollutants from chemicals from like weapons. I mean, that was, you know, that, that was like Halston Army Ammunition Plant. It was part of the uh, original storage of a series of caves for the Manhattan Project. Milan, Tennessee, Army Ammunition Plant. Um, you know, Radford, Virginia, Army Ammunition Plant. It's just everywhere. So, so the stuff is just spread out. Um, and we're going to, like, continue to move through the advance of the atomic age. And in order to like uh, create the bombs, we needed facilities, and we created a, a, a national uh, thermonuclear assembly line. Uh, the Atomic Secret City of Oak Ridge uh, was just where the population went from about 3,000 to 75,000 in a very short time. Uh, Aiken, South Carolina is where the Savannah River site, it was part of the Manhattan Project, 310 square miles, and its sole mission at the time was production of uh, weapons grade uranium and tritium, which is the hydrogen isotope that takes an atom bomb to a hydrogen bomb. And if you real tritium in that river, yeah, yeah. And it's built on a swamp um, and an earthquake fault line. I mean, it's one of the one of the one of the country's major earthquake faults, and it just runs straight up underneath it. Um, they changed the name from the Savannah River site uh, to the U.S. Energy Freedom Center. It's about one percent. feel better. <laughs> about one percent green and ninety nine percent nuclear. Mm -hmm. And it and, and like I was saying, before Fukushima went down, it was like thought to be the most irradiated site on the planet. Uh, our, um, Amar Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas, Pantex Warhead Assembly Plant, where like, you know, tens of thousands of weapons have been like taken apart, put together, you know, um, um, uh, increased, decreased, and their power uh, recycled and disposed of. It's now part of something called, uh, you know, the Life Extension Program, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Tell me when you need to stand up and take a big deep breath. But uh, eastern, uh, western Kentucky is uh, you know, in Paducah, so uranium enrichment plant, and we uh, it shut down. But that's where we've stored the majority of like the depleted uranium, waiting to be dispersed. Uh, this Back in Watts Bar, the, as it says here, the, with a nuclear reactor, we call it an bomb plant because you have to can't have one without the other. Every 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 atomic weapon has a reactor. In its assembly line, and this is and this is another uh, violation of the Geneva Conventions. You can't use a commercial uh, reactor for the production of weapons, and they produce tritium. Uh, this is just a map of our, you know, the thermonuclear nightmare. You can see Savannah River, Oak Ridge. Uh, in the middle of the country, we've heard the. Uh, uh, Kansas City had a demonstration and some work going on there. It produces about 2,000 of the non-nuclear elements and parts of thermonuclear weapons. That's why it is very important. Yeah, about 95 percent of what goes on. And um, billions have been, you know, dedicated for the life extension. I think it's three trillion. Well, three trillion is it's a trillion. We'll get to that slide in just a second. Oh, okay. But the original life extension program dedicated like you know billions and billions of dollars to like refurbish our weapons. And so we want another hundred years worth of life out of these thermonuclear weapons. And this is under the reign of a president that got the you know the Nobel Peace Prize for working with the Russians to take nuclear weapons off the shelf. But they had to. They were like rusting. They were leaking. They had to test them. They take them apart and put them back together with an increased firepower so they can claim fewer weapons, but they have greater firepower. Uh, this is what I think uh, you were referring to. Uh, the part of the, you know, like the, the extension program requires the uranium, a new uranium processing facility at Oak Ridge, which over a trillion dollars planned to, uh, to, to refurbish over the next 30 years. And um, if you have not been in touch or ever gone to the Oak Ridge Environmental Peace Alliance or OREPA.org, 
uh, to find out what they've been doing for the past 30 to 35 years holding the space in front of Oak Ridge, just like has happened at Kings Bay by another good group. This, this, it's well worth like going online and looking. So this is where nuclear weapons are transported across the country. It's not against the law to like take weapons. And who was it? Was it you that that you know that sat on the railroad? Uh, did you block the white train? Yes. She did too. Right. She was. We were talking about that. Yeah. I, I, mine was out in Bridgeton, Washington. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just another map of where we have been. But the uh, hands of the wise yes. Bought a place. Right on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, that's when I first met you. Right, people see this. And so th this is just a map of where we have, like, you know, stored or, or have in storage or have, like, you know, irradiated, like, in the country. And we don't dump it off off the shore anymore, but we did. And, you know, Hiroshima and the effects of, like, you know, incinerating in Japan began to haunt the U.S. And there's this guilt that built up. And you can remember some of. You know, some of the hysteria about, you know, duck and cover. I know I did that when I was in elementary school. And we had, like, Bert the Turtle tell you about it. And um, there was all kind of nuclear, you know, we call it nuclear madness. I was born in 1950, and I suppose some of y'all are, like, you know, cohorts. And you, you, you remember the fallout shelter handbooks. And, you know, you get your chemistry set, you know, it's experiment had a little bit of radioactive material in it. And it was all a big lie. Uh, that Eisenhower had to, you know. Well, his Adams for Peace was a way to kind of package it so that we could still produce what we needed to keep our, our stockpiles going um, and distract attention from the horror of using uh, atomic weapons. So we said, oh, well, using it for power. Essentially, that's uh, boiling water to get energy, isn't it? Nuclear power. Pretty much, but it was the, the trade off for selling electricity too cheap to meter to the public was just a, a cover for like the, the uranium and like the production of, of thermonuclear weapons because the corporation saw the money. The military saw the advantage, and that's what they wanted. So they had to come up with some program to sell it to the public. And so that's pretty much why we have nuclear power plants spread around. That's the way we went. And so much of the commercial waste, which is waiting to be, we, we, we do not have a plan to dispose of it. You know, it's like every one of those nuclear power plants, you know, you know, produces, you know, at one level, uh, material that can be used in the bombs. So the evil twins, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, or you know, it's, it's the only energy technology that's interchangeable and interdependent. So whether it's like one or the other, uh, I wish that we did not separate them all because nuclear power and nuclear waste and nuclear weapons are all the same. So spent fuel, we call it, you know, we, we, we do something called reprocessing the spent fuel to get the weapons grade plutonium. Uh, the map on the bottom left was in 2008. Uh, the, the corporation's plan to revitalize the nuclear power industry. They have failed so far. <clears throat> and questions about, you know, for people or for profits, what's the true cost of the 70-year nuclear nightmare over maybe 70 to $80 trillion? Okay. So the only way this could happen was with a certain type of welfare. In 1972, Wall Street was telling investors to get out of nuclear. It was a lemon. It could not happen. But I, if it just floated on the, on the market, it would be gone tomorrow. So it's one of the most heavily subsidized industries. And this is the way the southeast looks today with 37 reactor units, uh, including Louisiana and Arkansas. Per capita, they love building here because we're, our, our system of regulation is a, is a regulated monopoly. They get a promised profit. And then later on, there was a, a program called Construction Work in Progress where they could uh, dump the cost of a construction in the rate base before they completed the project. They could go 10 years, not finish it, turn it off, leave, and still get paid. Uh, this is uh, just a map of the, a seismic map there. There are like 23 Fukushima-style GE Mark IV reactors in the United States. Okay. So we're waiting now for a final decision on the transport of uh, maybe 100 truckloads over the next 10 years of radioactive uh, nitric acid out of Canada to end up coming through North Carolina, down into South Carolina, down to be reprocessed, or initially stored, but they hope to reprocess it, and um, that's a pretty nasty situation. There's just so many front lines everywhere you go, even though we know nuclear power, it, it, it's dirty, dangerous, and expensive. We've got 104 of those reactors, all this radioactive waste, tons and tons of this high-level waste. 
everywhere. This is Mary Olson on the left. Uh, she's very active with the Nuclear Information Resource and Services. A great website to get really up to speed on this issue. NIRS, and women particularly might be interested in reading her. The past year she produced a seminal study about uh, women because of the extra reproductive tissues are twice as impacted by radiation in men. And it probably wasn't a seminal study because Mary <laughs> produced it. But, but, well, I mean, it was, like it was a just fundamental a, study, yeah, a very yeah, important yeah, study. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, just three examples of plants. I mean, Shell Bluff in Georgia is, uh, you know, uh, this was supposed to be the revitalization plant where, our, you know, but there are unexplained cancers and it's mostly black, Burke County, Georgia. There's no requirement to do, you know, for any funds for testing air, soil, water, fish, people, wildlife, anything. Uh, Southeast Florida, uh, St. Lucie and, and Turkey Point was, they realized that strontium-90, which is a pollutant out of plants, is chemically analogous to calcium so they could like track it in the teeth of children. So that was the Tooth Fairy project. Uh, and it was increased childhood cancers all around the projects. Up in North Anna, Virginia, uh, they realize uh, within three years there's there's an average of you know 10, 11 percent rise in local infant deaths. And there was an earthquake out there not a year a few years ago where it shifted actually shifted the some, buildings there. Well, some large cast <laughs> heavy concrete metal casts. It was, it, but it just showed how vulnerable you know these these facilities are. And so um, they were trying to figure out what to do with it out in Yucca you know, Yucca Mountain was. A place for the final, um, you know, uh, burying of the commercial waste. But they abandoned it. They didn't know where to put it. They thought about putting it like in the uh, in the Appalachians, but now it's just been put on hold. They don't know really what to do with it. And so we literally are wasting the future. Yeah, it's how we're on site at all those places. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still stored on site, and until if we, we have to deal with it someplace, and I mean, just just 15 seconds burying it deep in granite works, but not in our mounds because those granite mounds are cleaved and like chiseled and like mm -hmm. cracked, and the, the water table moves all over the place. Um, but if the, the term is H O S S, Hoss, you know, hardened on site storage, it works. Big gigantic caps, the ones that were moved by the earthquake. Earthquake. Quake. But it works, and we don't have the technology really to deal with it. So let's store it on site. We can build burns around it to prevent, you know, you know, terrorists from attacking it from the road. And you know, in the future, we'll know more about what to do it. But, but temporarily. But moving it on our roads uh, is far more vulnerable. And if we let's move it, we need to move it once. And that's sort of the idea. The, the thing I love about the seventy thousand tons is that U.S. worldwide. U.S. They found guys shipping some of that stuff in a truck in Colorado. He was drunk driving. Oh, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that disclosure. Um, and in Asheville, we had a campaign. Asheville at the North Carolina and Asheville at the Nuclear Crossroads, um, and the axis of evil. Um, uh, just, just the the folly of transporting this stuff. There's especially through our mountains down to the Savannah River Cause, side. Because we have like you know, um, the coming together I forty and I twenty six, and it's headed into South Carolina. I mean, before they would bury it, they, you know, they wanted to take it into South Carolina, reprocess it, and then bury it. Um, one of the low level waste sites. Is, yeah. In Barnwell, and um, you know, it was for the longest time the only uh, low-level burial site east of the Rockies. Did we? Where are you out over there? <laughs> so y'all, y'all kind of either, uh, you know, we're getting we're getting down to the last part of it in just a few minutes. But if you do, we need to take a break. Are we on a roll? Almost at capacity. Uh, almost. You know. Low level is that hospital waste? Low, yes, it can be anything from like irradiated hospital waste to, I mean, something again that just doesn't work in a reactor. So the term low level is like a misnomer. So you want to talk about Tennessee real quick? Well, just I'm starting to get PTSD from this, but but all that 75% of all the U.S. low level radioactive waste is dumped in Tennessee. I mean, little Tennessee is taking it all, and often they don't tell people that they're dumping this stuff in from in, in not commercial landfills but municipal landfills, and they're incinerating. Yes, they're incinerating in Tennessee. Well, so that's that's burned radioactive waste that they're doing there. 
that's uh, that's that's uh, illustrating that they do burn it, whether that's specifically yeah. one. Um, but we do have these licensed incinerators in Tennessee. We actually we actually have contracts. I mentioned um, in Irwin where they have nuclear fuel services. Uh, there is another facility that's in Tennessee that is an incinerator, and had a contract. We're bringing they're shipping German waste into Tennessee to burn. They take the ashes and send it back to Germany. Well, they're all leaving us. Well, not all of them, but... I mean, but they're reprocessing a lot of this irradiated materials into belt buckles, into Something uh, they call, machine yeah. parts, pots and pans. Yeah. They're, 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 when they say low, they put it below regulatory concern and they continue to change what that is. So. But there is no known low level of radiation that does not cause biological damage. So below regulatory concern just means, eh. Do we know the belt buckles? Uh, uh, probably your buttons are irradiated. So what is the cost of war? I mean, first casualty is usually truth. You know, right what you're told. Isn't the other like journalists around? Doesn't that look like a gentle policeman? Actually, you know, protesting is just un-American. That's the Trump, you know, administration right there. Uh, civil liberties are restricted. I mean, has anyone ever had to be? Has anyone been restricted to a free speech sign? Has anyone yeah. voluntarily I mean, we, gone to Other than living in America, that's what we thought, you know, going to the SOA, a four-foot box. Um, resources are stolen. they got money for wars but can't feed the poor. And, you know, it is a war economy, and you have to ask yourself, is it working? So there's a loss of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and, like, um, the number of soldier suicides uh, in 2011 uh, exceeded... Uh, the number of battlefield deaths. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, military violence has come home. Our They're... friend Chuck Fager at uh, Quaker House near Fort Bragg, former, director, he's been... former director there, he was keeping track of the murders of, of you know, the, the soldiers coming home and then domestic violence resulting in murder. Um, how many more dead army wives must we deal with it? Well, how many more young men and women are we sending off to war to traumatize to that point? Uh, where we don't offer them any help. We deploy them uh, as war fighters and then we come home and uh, it's crime fighters. we I mean, militarize our police, as you can see. So in Iraq, when, Ron, when Roosevelt was asked, you know, what are you going to use to fight anything that we can? And that meant like pulling up the guard, taking your police people, taking your first responders, sending them to the war zone, militarizing them, then they come back to their jobs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we even end on a hopeful note, do we? Uh, well, the nonviolence. <laughs> I mean. you know, but we do, we do exhort you that nonviolent resistance, and according to Nuremberg, we know we have international duties transcending national obligations of obedience. We must disobey. We so must you, challenge. You know, so you can, you know, I mean, what do we do? Every one of you in this room have done some of, or if not all, of what you're about to say. And often you have some truth. Stepping, looking over your shoulder as you do it. That's educate, it. agitate, organize. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, confronting public officials. There's a war criminal. Uh, that's a pink, uh, code pink, you know, action. Mm -hmm. Oh, the orange one is. I know the orange one. And uh, I forget who she is, but she also was an earlier. Uh, you can withdraw support. A tax dollars around the world. That's Dave. <laughs> uh, you can create direct action. Uh, top left was like the undocumented, the undocumented um, um, you know, migrants and immigrants that started in California and headed to the DNC in Charlotte in 2012, and they just right in the middle of everything. You know, they're out of the shadows, unafraid. Uh, they just spread out this beautiful tarp mosaic uh, painting of like the monarch butterflies and just. Down well, there. Very brave, very high risk taking. Selling Montgomery. Uh, this is like, you know, uh, defending against the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, this is like young people in, uh, in Tucson, the U.S. Border Patrol office. I think that's where they came in and they popped their eyes open and, like, you know, put the, uh, uh, the pepper spray right, right there. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, I, I know some of the, sometimes we just want to go, but the next time you think about Keystone and what potentially could happen with other pipelines was that this was a, and a, a, a foreign multinational working with our U.S. government to use eminent domain to like run this trench through private property, and if you stepped in their way, there was a foreign security force ready to take you away. 
So in protest, picket, and pers you know, persist. Um, this is well. This is that's from, Memphis when when I was coming of age. This is the sort of scenes that I was every day as I went on my lunch break. The the, the scene of the the man who had to declare, "I am a man." Um, do y'all do y'all know who the White Rose Society was in Germany? Yep. Right, and so this is a UNC Asheville students doing basically the same thing that these students were doing, but these students in five days after they were reported were like, you know, round up, arrested, interrogated, and executed. Okay. You stand alone, together, you sit together, lie down. Squat, block, block. Now, now this is my first action. This is me right here. This is the nuclear train, 180 nuclear warheads. I really hoped and thought they would remove us from the track before the train went barreling over there. But we did stop it in time, as you can see. Close the climate. I think that's the uh, uh, small coal plant in Washington, D.C., bottom left. They hauled us away with the SWAT team. My mother saw it on the 5 o'clock news. She, she was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> on her deathbed, she told you what? Well, there's one thing, Claire, I haven't yet forgiven you for. <laughs> <laughs> bottom right is bottom right was like uh, an effective Earth first blockade of a particularly bad coal plant um, up in Virginia. We were serving as legal observers at this mountaintop removal uh, coal site, um, and uh, watching this. You take to the roads. Yeah, Azumi and Denise, the puppetesses to SOA watch. Uh, this is the undocu bus um, and carbon free, nuclear free. That's mm -hmm. the mantra. You can climb the fences. That's Diane. Well, there's Dr. Spock, I think. Oh, yeah, that's the protest you organized <laughs> many long years ago. John was helping them get over, trying to help them. They have a side of the I bet you were there, John. I... And uh, Diane Wilson on the right, she's one of the co-founders of Code Pink, and this is the 57th day of a solidarity fast uh, for, you know, protesting Guantanamo, and she's been helped over the fence outside the White House. You know, occupy the bomb plants. Well, you know the transform now plowshares who, uh, uh, who who kind of uncovered with their bold action the the inherent insecurity of our uranium um, storage facilities in Oak Ridge. You, you do have to risk, and you do sometimes put your life on the line. I don't think I don't know how many people realize after they went through cut through the third fence, they were in a pre-authorized lethal fire zone. Mm -hmm. Uh, arrest the war criminals. This, this was yeah. This was at <laughs> Southern Methodist University at the open of the Bush Library. Now I'm a graduate of Southern Methodist Did you say University. Library. Uh, L i e b u r y. And and we we uh, we arrived and joined with Code Pink and escorted the war criminals all through the streets of Dallas. It was a great way to return to my alma mater. We're searching for an accountability zone. Yeah, we kept looking. <laughs> And then uh, later on, I mean, uh, there was a point where the police cooperated 100% with us when, like, we had George Bush and Dick Cheney arrested. We, they, were, <laughs> they stepped into the street and they were arrested for jaywalking and they were slammed down. Perfect shot and went out. You know, just perfect. <laughs> you can become legal observers. Uh, we are not a lawyer. You've seen the green hats at demonstration. And, like, it's interesting. For the most part, the behavior of police will change usually. You know, when they know they're being watched, and you can, you don't have to wear a green hat. And I don't know all the laws in different states, but in North Carolina, there is no law that prohibits you from like taking pictures or photographing police if you stay out of their way. And actually, if you do do that, there is a free download called Mobile Justice by that's out there for by the ACLU. And if you are taking pictures and hooked to Mobile Justice, uh, it's automatically been stored in the main computer in North Carolina, Raleigh. So if the police come over and grab your stuff, it's already documented. But in Alabama, you can go to jail for taking pictures of 
Oh, that's right, David. Good to know. Well, that's why I went to jail. Your buddy Mike Green slammed me to the ground. Well, take it. Don't worry, you want a legal threat. I can tell you all about that. Keep, gotta keep, gotta keep your eyes open. Got another local, you know. It's eternal vigilance, and, and if we're going to try to convert war to peace, I mean, there's a lot of people trying on a lot of fronts for that. Um, and that's the last one. If we want to cherish what remains of the earth and to foster its renewal, it's our only legitimate hope of survival. I think that's the very truth of it. And Joan Baez, action is the antidote to despair. And how we take action, where we take action, depends on where we live and what's in front of us and where our level of courage and risk is. And uh, we keep right. on keeping on, as we all have. Thank you. So we release you. <laughs> all right.